So I, I can't give you any kind of official fancy introduction here. I do know in that we have done many radio programs together uh, over the years, and particularly more recently over the last year or two. And by the way, um, whenever we do a radio program together, um, it hits all the, the, the left-wing blogs go just, just insane. Well, they get two for one. They get her and me. So our April uh, interview, there were two April interviews, um, made it all the way up to Barack Obama, who hammered her and mocked her for the things she said, but it went that far up the chain. She referred to end times in that particular April, those April broadcasts. And then at the press dinner back in, in the spring, he got up and mocked and said, well, Michelle Bachman says, I'm going to bring on the end times. Well, he is. That's the truth. <laughs> so Michelle Bachman, my friend, come, where are you? Come on up. It's all yours. Go until 12. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. Isn't it wonderful to be here on this beautiful fall day in Eden Prairie, Minnesota? What a blessing to the Lord that we all get to be here. I am so proud of all of you from, for coming. I know I have come to this conference many, many years myself. I put it on my calendar early and I slip in and I watch it and I take it in and I love every one of the speakers that Jan has. She knows exactly who to invite every year. It's exactly right on the money. And she is a wonder. God has picked out Jan and she is a woman who is after God's own heart, much like David in the Bible. She is a woman after God's own heart. And I have known her, as she said, since I was a young college girl in Winona, Minnesota. It was far longer than 30 years ago. It was probably like 40 years ago now. And um, she was just as much of a fireball and a spit spitfire then because what she was doing for us was understanding the times and translating all the events that we were seeing back in the early 1970s and talking about them in relation to scripture. Because there was one seminal event that had changed everything for believers, and it was this. It was the modern infusion of the Jewish people onto the Jewish land and reconstituting that state in such a way that they'd even retained the ancient language, the faith, and all aspects, so much so that it truly was Ezekiel's dry bones coming together again in the land. And that one event has changed everything. Because as Peter and Paul wrote in the scriptures, when they spoke about the last days and Jesus coming again, this was one event that needed to take place. That event, Israel reconstituting itself, took place before I was born. But it is a generational event that defines the times that we live in. And I think that's why it is imperative that we do understand these times and therefore that we know how to live. I came to know Jesus Christ when I was 16 years of age. My life just completely changed. It was almost like if you remember that movie, The Wizard of Oz, where it starts out in black and white and then all of a sudden it goes to technicolor. And that's how I felt my life was when I came to know Christ. And that difference, that change, the only thing that I see in Scripture that is very similar is the way that uh, Peter, this wonderful, robust man who came to know Christ and put his 
whole body into his faith in everything that he did. He was robust for the things of the Lord. I see that in Jan Markell. I'm sure many of you here today feel that. When you came to the Christ, it wasn't just necessarily a slow slide. It was literally like the Apostle Paul, the scales falling from your eyes. Scripture tells us that the Lord quite literally lifts a veil from our understanding. So that now the Holy Spirit opens up the Word of God. We understand it in a way that is not just from our own natural understanding. It's a spiritual revelation that the Lord gives us. Not that we're so smart, but that He is so smart. And He speaks into our spirit His words, His thoughts, and He infuses us with what it is that He wants to know. And that's what it is that he's causing us to do, to be on offense, on the march. Christianity as a faith is not a faith that cowers in the corner or that despairs or that apologizes for what it says. Hardly. It is just the opposite. Christianity is a faith that is on the move. And I want to give you an example of Christianity on the march. Um, uh, the, the story of Acts is a wonderful story. And I will talk about perilous times. But what I want to do is lay this foundation of who we are in Christ, who we are as a nation. And I think when we first understand who we are, then we understand the grand larceny that has happened in this nation. The grand larceny of our legacy and of what prior generations have built up for us and what those that we stand on the shoulders of those in the faith, the sacrifice they have paid, and then we see the larceny that has occurred in our day, I want to provide that level of context. If you look at AD 80, Christianity spread further to the countries of France and Tunisia. Twenty years later, the first Christians were in Algeria and Sri Lanka. By AD 150, the gospel reached Portugal and Morocco, and Christianity found its way to Austria in AD 174, followed by Switzerland and Belgium. By AD 328, the gospel reached Ethiopia, Ethiopia, and almost 200 years later, Pope Gregory I sent Augustine of Canterbury to present-day England, and within one year, 10,000 were baptized in England, which had been a pagan area. In AD 635, the first Christian missionaries arrived in China. By AD 740, Irish monks brought the gospel to Iceland, but it wasn't until AD 900 that missionaries reached the country of Norway. And am I glad I'm 100% Norwegian. <laughs> By 1200, well, you can't help it, you're in Minnesota. By 1200, the Bible was available in 22 different languages. In 1491, missionaries arrived in the African Congo with the first church in Angola. A few years later, Kenya had its first known Christians. In Spain, the Pope, Alexander VI, wanted to send Catholic missionaries to the New World. And as a result, Columbus took priests with him on his second journey to the Americas. By 1531, Franciscan Juan de Padilla started his missionary work in Mexico City. And by 1550, Calvin sent French Protestants to reach the people of Brazil. By 1640, Jesuit missionaries reached the Caribbean and they landed in Martinique. In the early 1700s, we saw the rise of the Great Awakening in the United States where both George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards stirred revivals throughout our American colonies. And the church in America flourished and thousands of churches opened their doors where many, many were saved. You see, that's how quickly this faith moved mountains. I am so proud of our country, and part of what has energized me in my own life has been this magnificent nation that God gave to us. 
My favorite people in all of the history going back in our country is the history that was brought to us from the pilgrims. The pilgrims were persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ who had originally come from England, and because of the persecution that they felt there, they traveled across what is today the English Channel, and they went to the area now known as Holland. And they lived and toiled there for many years and thought this would be their new home where they could practice their faith in peace. Because that's what the scripture says that we are to do, to live holy, peaceable lives, growing in the things of the Lord, and that's what they attempted to do. But during their time when they were in Holland, Holland was the center of the Baroque capital of the world at that time. And all of the pleasures of life, and all of the innovations, and all of the temptations of life were in that area, and they saw that their children were quite literally being pulled away from the faith and attracted to all of the attractions of the world. And they also saw how, saw how hard life was for them, how hard they had to work just to keep body and soul together. And so as they were wont to do, they met together frequently in prayer. And the Holy Spirit spoke to them while they were there and put upon their heart that they needed to get a company of people together and they needed to remove themselves to this new world that they had heard about. In 1607 was the first permanent English settlement in this North American region. It was sent here by a charter company in England. And as you know, uh, uh, that particular settlement was brought about with Captain John Smith, with John Rolfe, and we often hear about Pocahontas, the Indian princess, who was there, who, the woman who God had sent as a provision, who didn't know him, but who was sent to help the early English settlers. What you don't know, and what is faithfully recorded, and proudly so, in your nation's capital, in the rotunda of our capital, is a huge historic painting. And that painting capsulizes the most important event in Pocahontas' life. You see, Pocahontas came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when she did, she sought to be baptized. She was taken to England where she had her baptism. And she changed her name to Rebecca, to the Christian name. And spent the remainder of her days faithfully living out a Christian life and bringing the gospel to everyone she knew after she had met and married John Rolfe. And that painting is in our capital. That isn't the only painting that hangs there. And the reason why I tell you that is because, you see, our nation was created on these pillars. These pillars... These pillars of a profound faith, a deep faith in Jesus Christ. You just didn't all of a sudden go to Delta.com and decide, I'm going to leave Holland and I'm going to go over to the United States. This was a huge undertaking that these brave individuals took. And they took it as their writings show us because of their fervency to bring the gospel to a, uh, to a native people group that they knew wasn't yet familiar with the claims of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that also happened with the pilgrims who had learned about this first English settlement in 1607, but in 20, 1620, they set about to leave Holland and come to the United States. They met, as I said, they prayed, as I said. They sold everything they had. They set about their plan. And as this day approached in 1620, I want to read to you what happened. You see, Governor Bradford, who was one of the governors of the Pilgrim Plantation, wrote a very famous journal about the time of the pilgrims. He wrote it, and then it was lost in a trunk, literally for hundreds of years. No one knew that he'd written this history. This history was found in the late 1800s, and this was the first edition of that book 
of Bradford's Journal. And I love these people so much because they embody the spirit of America. Why are we so different? Why are we a free market economy? Why are we a republic where we get to choose our leaders and where the sovereign in our nation isn't a king, the sovereign is every one of you in this auditorium today. You are the sovereign. And collectively, we get to choose the laws that we live under and the people who are our rulers. It was a legal system and a political system unlike anything the world had ever seen before. It was so remarkable. How did it come about? It came about because of our pilgrim fathers who understood the word of God and who understood that they were going to come to this new world like the children of Israel. That's how they saw themselves. Not replacement theology, but what they saw themselves as is like the children of Israel, bringing the gospel, living lives as much as they could as sinners in a fallen world, but living faithfully according to the biblical principles of Jesus Christ. I want to just give you a taste of what was in the heart of our first fathers who came to this country, the pilgrims. And you'll have to bear with me. This is King James English because that's what they spoke and that's how they wrote. So be patient with me as I read to you. So being ready to depart, they had a day of solemn humiliation. They humbled themselves before the Lord on that day before they left. Their pastor taking his text from Ezra, chapter 8, verse 21. Their pastor was John Robinson. And there at the river by Ahava, I proclaimed a fast that we might humble ourselves before our God and seek of him a right way for us and for our children and for all our substance. And I just want to intervene here. You see, the pilgrims, you must understand, were forward-looking people. They didn't just think about their own comfort. They didn't think about themselves in the moment. You see, in their mind's eye, they looked ahead. And you must understand this. They saw you, and they saw you, and they saw you. They knew that there were generations yet unborn. And that's what they were thinking of. And as a matter of fact, later in this book, Bradford writes that they saw themselves privileged to bring the gospel because they saw themselves and their humility as stepping stones, willing to lay the foundations that others could go forward to faithfully, as Paul told Timothy, faithfully transferring the gospel from one generation to the next. And by the Holy Spirit's impetus, they saw that God asked them and chose them to come to this land and faithfully transfer the gospel, not for themselves, but for you, for the generations yet unborn. Do you see why I love these people? Going back to Bradford's writing upon which the pastor spent a good part of the day very profitably and suitable to their present occasion. The rest of the time was spent in powering out prayers to the Lord with great fervency, mixed with an abundance of tears. You see, they knew they could very easily die on this journey. They knew that unless God was with them, they wouldn't even make it. They knew they would never come back to Holland again. Never. And so everything was on the line for them. And the time being come that they must depart, they were accompanied with most of their brethren out of the city unto a town sundry miles called Delft Haven, where the ship lay ready to receive them. So they left that goodly and pleasant city, which had been their resting place near 12 years. But they knew they were pilgrims, and get this, and look not much on those things, 
as the Bible told Abram, to be pilgrims and to live in tents and to keep moving. They saw themselves as pilgrims and they looked not at the things that they left behind. But they lift up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country. That, you see, was their country. Not Holland, not even where they were going. Heaven was their country, and they quieted their spirits. When they came to the place, they found the ship and all things ready. And such of their friends as could not come with them followed after them. And sundry also came from Amsterdam to see their ship and to take their leave of them. That night was spent with little sleep by the most, but with friendly entertainment and Christian discourse and other real expressions of true Christian love. The next day, the wind being fair, they went aboard and their friends with them, where truly doleful was the sight of that sad and mournful parting, to see what sighs and sobs and prayers did sound amongst them, what tears did gush from every eye, and pithy speeches pierced each heart, that sundry of the Dutch strangers that stood on the quay as spectators could not refrain from tears. Even non-believers had to cry. Yet comfortable and sweet it was to see such lively and true expressions of dear and unfeigned love. But the tide, which stays for no man, called them away that were thus loath to depart. Their reverend pastor fell down on his knees, and they all with him, with watery cheeks, commended them with most fervent prayers to the Lord and his blessing. And then with mutual embraces and many tears, they took their leaves of one another, which proved to be the last to many of them. I read this to you because what I just described is the second painting that hangs in the United States Capitol Rotunda. It is the painting of John Robinson, their pastor, who couldn't leave and go with them. He had to deputize other men to be the pastor. He had to stay behind with the congregation in Holland. But the painting that is hanging in the Capitol is of John Robinson. All of the eyes of everyone on that ship, they are looking up to heaven. The holy scriptures are open in front of them. It says the Geneva Bible. And as they are crying out to God, some of them are soulful, and they know what they are leaving behind. Their expressions are etched on this painting. On the sail of the ship are three words inscribed. And when you go to the Capitol, you will read this. It says, God with us. God with us. You see, it was by faith that the Pilgrim Fathers came here. They could do it because God was with them. That's the beginning of the foundation. There's two more paintings that tell a Christian story. But what I want to do is lay that foundation for you of a believing nation. Don't believe the lies that you hear when people say to you, they were all secularists seeking after gold. They came here as deists. That is absolute hogwash. Because you see, from 1620, it took very little time. The Pilgrim Fathers wanted to make sure that they had pastors here. So in a very short years, they started one of the first colleges in the United States, Harvard College, for the purpose of preparing Christian pastors to spread the gospel across the United States. That's why Yale began. That's why Princeton began, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ upon this nation. If you go to the United States Capitol, this, this isn't at all what this speech was supposed to be about, but you need to understand this, <laughs> that all across the Capitol are evidences of the price that was paid for our liberty. You see, the way of man is not liberty. 
The way of man without God is enslavement. Christ came to set us free. And because of that knowledge of the scripture and that knowledge of what God has done for us that laid the foundation of the most unique nation in all of history in the United States in the freedoms that we have been given and what we in turn have been able in a bountiful sense to give to the rest of the world. In the house chamber, there is a picture of the lawgivers because the House of Representatives is the most powerful body. You wouldn't know that today, but it is. It's the most powerful body. And it is because the founders gave to the House the power of the purse, the power to tax you. I'm a former federal tax litigation attorney. That's what I did for a living. It's not that fun, but somebody's got to do it. I dealt with taxes. One thing I learned in my tax training is that the power to tax is the power to destroy. So the men and women that you send to Congress are very important because they have the legal right to take your money from you. The, that's why the House chamber is ringed with visages of lawmakers throughout all of history. Every lawmaker is in a profile, and you will see their profiles all around the chamber. When you saw recently the Pope speaking, he was speaking at the lectern where the President of the United States stands when he speaks. But what the Pope looks straight at were the double doors, when you see the president come in to give his State of the Union speech, the double doors open, the president, the pope come in, and right above those double doors, as the pope was looking straight forward, he looked directly into the full face of the greatest lawgiver of all time, Moses. Moses. There is no other lawgiver in the house chamber that has a full face. Only Moses. And Moses in the center. Why? Why? Blackstone, the famous English jurist, told us. He wrote England's common law. And Blackstone said it is because our law is based upon the Ten Commandments given to us by a holy God. And so Moses the lawgiver, the Ten Commandments are the basis of all of American law all of English law and of any sane law that works, it descends out of the Ten Commandments of God. You see, that is our heritage. That is our legacy. That is the gift that was given to the United States of America. And out of that context, out of that context, we see today what has happened in the United States an unraveling, unprecedented. We are the longest continuous constitution in existence today in the world. No, even though we're a fairly young country in the world, we have the longest existing constitution. I believe because it was built upon and written upon these godly values. But we are seeing an unraveling like nothing else. As Jan has said, we live in perilous times. And that is true if you're an unbeliever. These are not perilous times if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Because as I began my remarks today, our faith is not a defense faith. We are an offense faith. These are not times for us to be frightened. There are frightening things that are happening in our world today. But these are not uh, events that I believe that need to frighten the believer in Jesus Christ. Because I think both Paul and Peter have told us in, in, uh, in their epistles that 
of, of these days, these days have been foretold, and as I have said with Jan on her show, these are the days that we are living in that the prophets foretold that they long to live in. And you and I are privileged to be here and see these events as they unfold. And as I told Jan, I have probably spent more time pouring into this speech and these remarks than I have almost any other speech I've ever done. And yet it's because the events are tumbling so fast, I can't keep up with them. When I was in Congress, I went to Congress on offense. I stayed in Congress for eight years on offense. I went because I felt the Lord called me to go there. I ran for president four years ago because I felt uh, the Holy Spirit saying to me that I was to uh, run for president of the United States. He also called me out of that race and he called me out of Congress. But in each of those instances, I was full on on offense with the work that I was supposed to be doing. And I'm so grateful that I did. When I, when I left running for the presidency, I quite literally was uh, leaving Cedar Rapids, Iowa on a plane. I was bound for Florida, and I, I was praying, and I said to the Lord, now what? You told me I was supposed to run for president. You called me out. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to go back to Congress? What am I supposed to do? And before that plane landed, the Holy Spirit spoke to me as clear as could be. And the Lord shared with me to go back to Congress and to completely double down and focus on foreign policy, national security, and intelligence. And I was privileged to be able to sit on the Intelligence Committee. We, we deal with the nation's classified secrets, in particularly in the area of terrorism. People don't know uh, what we do for obvious reasons. Everything we do is behind closed doors um, and super secret areas. And it was a privilege to be a part of that area. So I rearranged my life completely. And as busy as we are, it's an amazing life. It's like you hit the blender on frappe, and it's like that's kind of how busy your life is. I carved out 40 hours a week just to pour into this area because, because this is where I believe the Lord wanted me to focus my time and attention. And what I saw amazed me. Not only the events as they were unfolding, as we have seen the rise of terrorism with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State and Iran and all the events that have been transpiring, but what I saw, as I had shared with Jan, that it reminded me of the scripture. I remember sitting on Intel one day specifically, reading things. I mean, I would leave that room sh literally shaking some days, shaking wondering what was going to happen next. And I remember thinking, the scripture talks about birth pangs, the beginning of birth pangs. I had given birth five times. I know I've been there, done that. I know what goes on in that. And for all the women here, you've been there, done that. You know what I'm talking about. Because you see, when the labor pains start, they are uh, farther apart. They're not as intense. When you get down to the very end, you don't even know what room you're in. You're, everything, you're just captured by the pain holds you. You don't hold the pain. Put it that way. You can't stop your body. That baby's coming out. You can't stop it. And that baby is born. And what I saw with Jan, I told her, is that I, and obviously I, I don't disclose, never have, never will disclose classified secrets, but what I saw is that there was a burning intensity and a frequency that ticked up to a level that I'd never seen before. I spent my entire life paying attention and reading. And that's one thing I'd recommend for anyone who wants to go into politics. Spend your lifetime reading and knowing and understanding what's going on. But what I saw was something very, very different with what was changing. And, and uh, let me also say that uh, the world has been arranged in modern history under a banner of various nations of the world controlling the world order. For a period of time, France was the leader of the world. For a period of time, uh, Spain was the leader of the world. For a period of time, Britain was the leader of the world in an era that was known as Pax Britannica. 
and it was an ordered safety, and they dominated the world. Somewhere along about 1943, the baton was transferred, and Pax Americana began in 1943. And the United States has remained the dominant force, I believe, for good in the world. We have been the world's leading economic superpower. We have been the world's leading military superpower. This last week, events have literally turned out of control with the UN and all of the events that were going on at the UN. This is a very strange last couple of two weeks. You've been observing, that's why you're here. But it, it's very odd what has been happening. The UN, as you know, is engaging in this, this sustainability thing called 2030, uh, where, they've, where their plan has always been, and it's these few little uh, kingmaker masters of the universe who love to pull strings. This is not conspiracy theory stuff. These are uh, people who actually think like this, who think that it would be better if all of the people of the world were in one big system. So that, uh, so that we all come together under this banner of peace, kind of a UN thing where we all come together. And it is an economic Marxism where it is a redistribution of wealth, because you hear about income inequality, that's all about making sure everybody's kind of making the same amount of money, and then also erasing national borders and sovereignty of nations so that our sovereignty goes away and our allegiance then is to one global body. Now that's done. It doesn't work. <laughs> Take a look at the UN. For 70 years, this oddball contingent hasn't been able to shoot straight or get anything right. They cause a disaster wherever they go. It is the United States and the Samaritan's Purse and you know, organizations like that, the Red Cross and different organizations who go out and actually make the difference and make the help. But this last week, something changed that was very, very different that I think portends that America may be at the point where we are not handing off the baton. I believe America may have dropped the baton this last week. And in its place, I don't even think they can believe it, a gleeful Rush, communist Russia, communist China, jih Islamic jihadist terrorist state Iran, has gleefully picked up this baton, and they've decided they're going to be the new domina dominators of the world. You need to know what happened on Wednesday. Jennifer Griffin from Fox News uh, told uh, the radio host Mark Levin on uh, Wednesday, September 30th, she got a call a little um, after 4 o'clock in the morning. She got a call from one of her sources in the Middle East. She said that at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, which I have visited there several times, at that embassy, in walked in a three-star Russian general. He was holding official orders from Russia. Now, look at the context. The day before September 30th, on the 29th, our President Obama met with Russian President Vladimir Putin at the U.N. Putin hadn't spoken at the U.N. for 10 years. He spoke at the UN, as did our president, where he lectured us, by the way, not to equate uh, terrorism with uh, Islam. <laughs> and in their 90-minute meeting, they were supposedly trying to talk about how they were going to be doing Syria and defeat the Islamic State. President Obama went his way. President Putin went his way. What happened within a few hours? Within a few hours, Russia, Iran, Syria, all bloodthirsty madmen took over Syria and kicked the United States out. Gave us our walking papers and said, vamos. And they did. They went into Syria. Why? 
Putin had been working for weeks to bring in jets and to build up his air base. He already had a naval presence there. They went into Syria because there was no pushback. There has been no pushback from NATO. There has been no pushback from the United States. The Russian bear went into Georgia, a former Soviet satellite state. You see, Putin's on the march. Russia's on the march. Communist Russia is on the march. Communist China is on the march. Communist Cuba is on the march. The Islamic jihadists, the terrorists of Iran are on the march. All of their proxies are on the march. Why? Because they rightly deduced the Pax Americana that has kept the peace in the world Drop the baton. And you see gypsies, tramps, and thieves go in when they see an opening. When there is a vacuum, in they go. And so despite the head fake on Tuesday between our president and Vladimir Putin, I don't even know, and I'm not being partisan, I don't even know if our president or our defense secretary or our secretary of state even, I don't even know if it's hit them yet what happened on Wednesday. That the communists went into Syria and kicked us out. Because you see, last night another news story came out from Philip Breedlove, the uh, uh, allied commander of NATO, whom I've met with in Brussels. Philip Breedlove said last night that Russia has put in a uh, denial bubble over Syria, and it certainly isn't meant for the Islamic State. It's meant for us. We have no access. Our planes are not allowed into Syria. Our personnel are not allowed into Syria. Our allies are not allowed in Syria. We've been in there for four years, digging around. Four years. Have you seen much happening with the Islamic State? The Islamic State has been growing. They have been conquering. They've been slitting the throats of innocent Christians. They have crucified innocent Christians. They have killed Yazidis. They have enslaved Christian women. They have raped Christian women. They have raped and enslaved innocent Christian children. This isn't, no, this isn't an Arab Spring where we're seeing Jeffersonian democracy just bust out all over in the Arab world. That isn't what's happening. This is the expulsion of Christians from the Middle East. The extermination of Christians in the Middle East. You see, these Islamic jihadist terrorists are on the march. Iran is the number one designated terror state in the world. Why in the world, in any universe, would the United States of America reach out to the world's greatest killer who has written a book? He has written a book about how he is going to destroy the Jewish state of Israel who has declared in the last two weeks Israel won't exist in the next 25 years, whose lead commander said it will be a privilege to carry out the Ayatollah's order of the annihilation of Israel. Do we think the Ayatollah insincere? That he doesn't mean death to Israel? That he doesn't mean death to the United States? These people are more serious than anything you can imagine. They are on the march. And what president would do a deal where they make the way for the greatest terror state that is in existence to have achieved their goal of nuclear bombs? That is what we have done. They will achieve this goal. Our president even said it himself several months ago, that within 13 years, they will have nuclear bombs. They will have intercontinental ballistic missiles. They will have access to arms. How do we know that? We just interdicted an arms shipment from the Iranians to more terrorists near Yemen. You see, what are these communists up to? What are these jihadists up to? World domination, yes. 
They're in the process now of controlling the world's chokeholds. Communist China plays a very long game, a very long game. They're flying under the radar, but they're on the march. In the South China Sea, 50% of all the world's goods travel through the South China Sea. And what are we doing with our naval empire? We're keeping 12 miles away from them to make sure that we don't somehow escalate them or make them mad. See, we are real nervous right now that we might make the Russian bear mad. We might make communist China mad. We don't want to make anybody mad because, you see, our answer is we're going to talk them to death. Oh, that's working real well. That's not Russia's move. See, Russia's answer is we take territory. Communist China's move is we're going to steal you blind. Because the, the communist Chinese move is cyber warfare espionage. They have stolen trillions of dollars, trillions, from the United States of America. We spend money to make our weapon systems, they steal it. That's what's happening. And so today, China will be building the oil and the natural gas facilities for Iran. This $150 billion check that Iran is going to get is going to be divvied up. And all the gypsies, tramps, and thieves are going to go in and take their part. China's going to be building up the natural gas. And they're going to be building up the oil fields for Iran. Russia wants more oil from Iran. Their economy is weak and on the skids. It's interesting. All these countries that I've been mentioning, they're actually weak right now. Russia is weak right now. China is weak right now. Cuba was weak right now. Iran was dying on the vine. We went in inexplicably. We've enriched them. We have empowered them. We've enabled them. None of it makes any sense. You'd never do this in any universe. But that's why I say there is a powerful delusion today, a powerful delusion that is bringing about these events. And I believe this last Wednesday, when Russia made that move, and when we know what is going to happen in Iran, because you see, we've already committed ourselves to holding workshops for the Iranians where we're going to teach them how to not get sabotaged in their nuclear program. <laughs> and we've committed that we are going to provide protection for their military program. Presumably, that's our money, that's our soldiers. Okay, you think we're ever going to go in and attack that nuclear hardware? I don't think so. Three times rogue nations, and I'll end with this, three times rogue nations have had their nuclear programs ended. All three times it was through military use. One was in Iraq in the early 80s. And Saddam Hussein had an illicit rogue nuclear program. He was going to use it for evil. That program was taken out. It didn't start a war. It was taken out, and it kept the peace. Another pro when, when Muammar Gaddafi in Libya saw that program taken out of Saddam Hussein, I'm not making this up, he literally called the Bush White House, and he... Er, uh, I, I'm sorry, he, he called the White House and he said to them within three days of, that, of the Iraq nuclear program taking out, uh, he said, I've got a nuclear program, as you know, and I don't want to go up and smoke. Would you please come and get it? And that's what we did. Honest to God, that is the truth. The United States went into Libya. We took their nuclear program out so that Libya wouldn't have a nuclear program. When I was in Congress, uh, there was an illicit pro uh, nuclear program going up in Syria. That was also taken out. All three times it was taken out successfully militarily. Now, I want to ask you this. Iraq, Syria, Libya. All three today are controlled by the Islamic State, various flavors of Al-Qaeda and terrorist groups, um, as well as other rogue, unsavory creatures. Can you imagine if those nuclear programs were in their hands? And the Islamic State has plans for that. You see, that's what we should do 
After I left the presidency, I traveled to Israel. I met privately with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I talked to him about my concerns in, at that time. And one thing that I urged the Prime Minister on that early visit in early 2012, I urged him to please take matters into his own hands and do what had successfully been done before to end a nuclear program, go into Iran, take that out, and please do that because this is coming from me. And again, this is not Jan Markell. Don't blame her. Don't blame this ministry. Blame me. Because I saw, in my opinion, the President of the United States could not be accounted, uh, counted on to have Israel's back. Because I ask you today, who has Israel's back today? Who does? The worst national security day in our history was July 20th when all the nations of the world signed that Iran agreement, and that Iran agreement, the purpose is to seal Israel's fate with nuclear bombs. The Ayatollah tells you every day, that's what his plan is. Every nation of the world, the, the, main, the six main countries signed that deal, and they're the ones that are going to make it happen. What country, I ask you, has Israel's back today? You see, these are perilous times. I don't believe it will be 13 years until Iran has nuclear bombs. I think it will be far sooner. As I told Benjamin Netanyahu and urged the Prime Minister to take that action, I recognize that, was, that is not something easy for him to do. They're the size of New Jersey. You know, they fight above their weight, but come on, take out the nuclear program in Iran? We need to do that. The good news is we could do it today if we wanted to. We could take it out. It would take us six to eight weeks. It's a whole series of maneuvers that you have to do, but we could do it, and we could take out that nuclear hardware. I say to you, in a sane world, that's what a freedom-loving nation would do, is remove weapons of death from a madman. All of that is perilous, perilous times. But again, what I say to you into the context, you needed to know what happened today. I believe that this last Wednesday, what happened this last Wednesday, we're going to continue to very quickly see this unfolding happening around us. But the United States has been given its walking papers. And I fear that the Pax Americana has ended and that now it is a new day and it is a new world. Yes, perilous times. But in the midst of that perilous times, the Apostle Peter is very clear. And Paul is very clear. This is going to come. Persecution is going to come. But you need to be get, having your lives right before the Lord. You need to live quiet and peaceful lives. You need to spread the gospel. And you need to be ready for what. Peter wrote was that day of the grand entrance that the Lord has for us when we go to what the pilgrims called their true country, their true home. This isn't it. This is fading away. We're going to our true home with joy. And so what we're to be about right now is to spread the gospel one by one, two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five, six by six, seven by seven, eight by eight, nine by nine, 10 by 10, 11 by 11, 12 by 12. We spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to bring liberation, wholeness, and peace to a sin-sick world. What a better use of time could there be?